when you parse through these numbers and hearing a little bit more from the CEO, should we be paying more attention more to the revenue growth or to the bookings growth here? Yeah, uh, good question, Katie. Uh, I, I think looking at the underlying the, of the business, or any of the gig economy company, whether you look at Uber or Dash, I think gross bookings is definitely one area one should look at very carefully. And if we look at gross booking as an underlying growth, the part of business actually accelerated for the quarter, um, uh, about six points for the quarter. This is mainly due to picking up in terms of business travel and also increased adoptions of the new product, such as reserve and taxi as well. And if you look at the profitability of the business, that also did very well. They keep that guidance for 4Q actually is above the street by 5%. So overall, we thought the company exit. Seems like we, uh, oh, here we are. By 20%. Sorry, James, go ahead. We lost you for a moment. Okay, uh, delivery EBITDA actually beat expectation by 20% due to, you know, lower customer acquisition and also driver acquisition costs. So net net execution was very clean and we expect more catalysts coming up in the future quarters. So clean execution, more catalysts coming up and uh, marrying that together with what again we heard from the CEO saying that Uber is well positioned for the journey ahead in good or bad macro environments. Talk to us a little bit about that, how Uber fares if we do head into a downturn of sorts in the U.S., maybe not even a recession. How does that affect Uber's business model and the ride sharing industry overall? Yeah, that's a fair point. And that's one of the things that management actually addressed on the call. And obviously, as a consumer platform, you are not totally immune as a company for Uber on any of the weakness on um, economic activities going forward, but relatively speaking, they're a little bit more resilient. If you think think about them as a service, right, whether it comes to rides or food delivery, the price consideration for their product are actually lower than a lot of products out there uh, that's considered high price consideration, for example, as travel. So relatively speaking, they tend to be more resilient than high price items, you know, when you look at the consumer products in general. Growth in the delivery segment was a little more sluggish than in the other parts of the business. And of course, Uber Eats competes directly with DoorDash. What is it that DoorDash does that Uber Eats could learn from or could emulate? Okay, and that's a great point. And that's one of the things that Uber Eats are, um, they are working towards in 2024, which is to reduce the defect rate the percentage of delivery that will return or exchange, and they see a lot of opportunity. What they talk about is that, you know, they can save their uh, defect rate going into 2024. If they're successfully doing so, that can capture additional EBITDA, EBITDA upside, excuse me, going to 2024. Gotcha. We were talking about WeWork earlier and how it was once a high-flying startup. Uh, Uber, no longer a startup either, um, but would you say it's a mature, profit generating companies already or are there still some visible growing pains yeah yeah good point uh i think uber at this point in time if you look at their category leading position in terms of ride sharing they are enjoying the economies of scale and also the network density that can continue to drive margin upside going forward in terms of delivery there are a lot more new opportunity they recently enter into grocery delivery that can provide meaningful opportunity in terms of driving bookings and also advertising opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. So I see, you know, part of their business kind of uh, reach the optimization of the EBITDA, you know, with category leading position. Another part of business that was got quite a bit of growth potential in delivery going forward. Also, James, uh, it looks like Uber at some point will be eligible for inclusion in the S&P 500. I wonder from where you sit what that means for its investor base and whether that will push Uber to return capital to shareholders through buybacks or through a dividend. Yeah, a very good point, right? Um, they achieved gap EPS for the last 12 months, which means they are qualified to be inclusion in S&P 500, that being first. And also at the same time, uh, I, I think they, they've been uh, looking at their capital structure very closely. 
right? And in terms of looking at the debt structure, and there's a very good chance that their debt will be upgraded by rating agency to investment grade in the future quarter. And that will allow them to lower the cost of capital for funding. And also potentially as the company grow their free cash flow, they can look for ways to increase shareholder value, like increase getting into uh, buyback program, like you mentioned before.